welcome everyone um, and thanks for joining today's webinar on the small studies program. Trish, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you to introduce our, our panelists and um, provide an overview of the program. Hi, my name is Trish Quinn. I'm the program coordinator at CPWR for its small studies program. We're glad you could join us today. Today, you're gonna to hear a short presentation on the small studies program and how to apply for funding. We currently have funding available and want to encourage researchers with good study ideas to apply. We'll also hear from principal investigators of two completed small studies who will discuss their research findings. Dr. Chuma Nanji from the University of Alabama, Dr. John Gambatis from Oregon State University, and Dr. Ziyu Jin from the University of New Mexico. We'll have time for questions at the end and Jess Bunting will moderate that. The Small Studies Program is funded as part of CPWR's cooperative agreement with the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. In 1993, CPWR established the Small Studies Program to attract new investigators into the field of construction safety and health research to help define problems and to investigate target research priority areas and to conduct and pilot hypothesis generating research. Since then, this program has provided successful applicants with seed money of up to $30,000 and the flexibility to initiate short term studies of up to 12 months. Over the years, funded studies have encompassed diverse scientific aims, investigators, and applicant organizations. CPWR has funded 127 studies. For a study to be considered, the topic must be related to CPWR's mission and respond to industry-driven priorities, including the NIOSH strategic goals, the National Occupational Research Agenda for Construction, and the 2018 NIOSH Construction Program Expert Panel Report recommendations. During the current funding period, priority is being given to studies aimed at finding innovative approaches to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the construction industry through ventilation, distancing, and respirators, reaching high-risk populations such as small employers, vulnerable workers, residential and late commercial construction contractors, getting best practices adopted, which is research to practice, and finding ways to overcome the barriers for intervention adoptions, addressing emerging issues and exploring new technologies, improving safety culture and safety climate, exploring innovative and new directions in construction sciences, evaluating promising research translation products, and disseminating good practices to small employers. CPWR is particularly interested in studies that plan to work with and or target small employers in the US construction industry. CPWR defines a small employer as less than 20 employees. Because small employers account for the majority of construction establishments, hire approximately one third of construction workforce and experience two thirds of fatalities. In addition, they are less likely to embrace essential safety practices and are slow to adapt new approaches to occupational safety and health. Everything you need to know about the Small Studies Program is available on the Small Studies website, which is maintained on the main CPWR website at www.cpwr.com. You can navigate to the Small Studies page by either searching for the Small Studies on the main page, which is up in your right-hand side, you'll see the search bar, or by clicking the Research tab and going down to the Small Studies link which you'll see over here on the right. The Small Studies Guidelines, which is included on the Small Studies webpage, is for researchers interested in funding. They should review the Small Studies Guidelines because it explains in detail the requirements and process in detail on how to apply for funding and what the approach is for CPWR. Applying 
for a small study is a two-step process. The first step is to submit a letter of intent, and if it's approved, CPWR will request a full proposal. CPWR encourages its investigators with an interest in improving construction worker health and safety to apply. Innovative proposals from occupational safety and health researchers, ergonomists, epidemiologists, researchers partnering with industry practice, practitioners and others are welcome to apply. Funding is not available to international organizations though. So let's look at the requirements for a letter of intent. We use a rolling admissions process. So a letter can be sent at any time. It can be no more than four pages and it has some um, required elements. Obviously the applicant organization, PI credentials and contact information and a study title. The body of the letter should include a summary of the proposed study, including aims and objectives, methods, research design, and selected references showing how this study contributes to the knowledge in the field. We really wanna know in very short paragraphs what it is the investigator wants to do. We also provide some questions in the guidelines documents for the investigator to consider as they're um, putting together the letter of intent. And as a reminder, the funding ceiling for a small study is $30,000 in total costs, and it must be completed in 12 months or less. Each letter of intent submitted for consideration will be reviewed by an internal CPWR panel appointed by CPWR's executive director, Chris Kane. Each reviewer will use a form and uniform scoring system. The executive director will use the reviewer's scores and comments to determine whether to proceed with a request for a proposal. It is important to make sure that the instructions have been followed before submitting the letter of intent because there is no opportunity to revise and resubmit a letter. CPWR will notify the principal investigator if the letter is rejected or to request a full proposal. CPWR uses the PHS 398 application for proposals. I'm not gonna go through the, re the review criteria used for evaluating proposals, but again, I will point you to the guidelines document for specific details on that. A full proposal follows similar review process, whereas it's reviewed by a CPWR panel, including a member of CPWR's technical advisory board, a NIOSH reviewer, and if warranted, a subject matter expert. For more information, here is my contact information, Trish Quinn, along with my email address. And I also again remind you that all the information you could need to know on the Small Studies Program is included on CPWR's website. Thank you very much. Shuma, you should be set up to share your screen. All right, can you see my screen? Yes, looks good. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you um, for inviting me, you know, to make this presentation or to the webinar. Um, like I already said earlier, my name is Chumar Naji, and um, I participated in one of the small study projects that, were, that was funded um, last year. And the title of the um, project um, was Pro Protocols for Assessing Human-Robot Interactions, which we call HRI, and the safety risks involved with such an interaction. Um, as part of the project, I worked with um, Dr. John Gambitis and also my grad student who is on the call um, today, Ifani Opala. And um, we went through multiple processes, which I'm going to um, discuss here in the few, in the few minutes. So before I jump into the project itself, I want to provide some background that, I, that, lead, that you know, provides justification for you know, performing such a study. Um, at this point, we should all know that construction plays a vital role in both economic um, progress and also in terms of, you know, hiring manpower and folks, you know, in, in across the U.S. and also um, globally um, as well. Now, you would expect that with, a, with um, an industry this big and this vital that we will, you know, be 
uh, maximizing our productivity or we will be performing at a high level of from a safety perspective, but that's not really the case. Um, available data shows that we have um, flattened in terms of productivity or remained flat in when looking at productivity over the past 20, 25 years. And when we think about our um, performance from a safety perspective, um, we have at best again stayed flat, you know, but you know, recent data shows that there's been a little bit of an increase in the, in the trend when you're looking at number of fatalities and also the rate of um, fatalities um, as well. So in terms of contextualizing it from an economic perspective, when looking at the uh, poor performance, um, we can see that you know the, the money being lost because of poor productivity and uh, poor safety is, is quite significant. So the question here is, you know, how can we improve um, safety? How can we improve productivity? How can we improve product performance as a whole? Um, there's been a lot of a lot of research, you know, done within this space to figure out the best ways to um, improve performance. And um, what we found out, you know, is that the best way to go about, or one of the better ways to go about it, is you know through digitization. Uh, multiple technologies have been used in terms uh, with regard to you know, construction work, you know, process based, you know, safety specific, uh, quality specific. But you know, of recent, you know, there has been a, a push for the introduction of you know robot and automation. And when I and what I mean by robots will be you know, devices that augments or replaces the need for you to have a, a worker and um, does the work on behalf of you know physical um, um, people. Um, and that thereby, you know, reducing exposure of those workers or reducing the possibility of them being associated with or impacted by musculoskeletal disorders. Um, but the question that, that we have here is that when we look at the existing studies, there has been a primary focus on where we can apply, you know, um, robots and automation, where, um, how well they can function, be it in a field setting or in a controlled setting. And what factors you know impact the adoption of these um, technologies? There's been little reference or mention um, with regards you know the safety risk associated with this technology. So that's the hazards that are introduced by these technologies, or you know enhanced or exacerbated by the use of this um, technology. So um, to fill this gap, uh, I worked with the research team. To first of all, you know, develop you know, insight, practical resources that practitioners um, could use to first of all identify, you know, concerns, that's the hazards, and to also quantify, you know, those hazards that are associated with um, human-robot interaction. Now, to achieve that, we set um, um, about four key objectives. The very first was around the identification of the of the hazards, which is which, which is very fundamental. Um, the next was to figure out how to quantify the, the hazards that we identified. Then beyond that was to figure out, okay, now that we know the hazards, now that we know which um, safety risks are, you know, are critical, how do we prevent it? Can we provide resources for folks to use to prevent such concerns? And the last was actually developing the resource that folks could use to you know, prevent you know, significant safety, safety concerns when using the different types of robots um, that we have out there. So to achieve the goal and the objectives um, that we that we set forth, we used um, a multi-phase, multi-multi-method approach that included a, a detailed um, systematic literature review, and the review was done to help us identify the different types of hazards that um, have been discussed in both academic and non-academic literature. Um, also, we wanted to figure out, okay, what are feasible strategies that folks have kind of like implemented um, out there in the industry and also help us identify the different factors that would typically you know, influence the, the use of um, the robots and you know, automate, automations that I already referenced. The next um, thing that we did was to figure out a way to quantify um, the, the safety risks. And to do that, we relied on a Delphi pro um, process that we had to modify a bit just to help us you know, meet the goals within the time frame and the resources that are available. And uh, the, the Delphi panel was put together and um, we went through uh, three rounds. 
um, to help us, you know, synthesize what we found in literature to, um, to help us also, you know, quantify the, the, the different factors that we were concerned about and to help us, you know, verify if the way, if what we're thinking as folks in, acad in, in the academic space will translate properly to practice. And the last uh, research step that we that we undertook was uh, conducting interviews with you know some safety professionals, and the goal here was to um, verify that the findings that we um, you know produce as part of the research is actually translatable you know to to practice. So that's an important component uh, within the um, research to practice domain. So we had interviews with um, safety professionals and a few academics as well to help us ensure that we achieved that um, R two P goal. The very last thing I want to highlight here is that, you know, through the research, we're able to produce two primary products, which I believe will be available online, you know, within a month or so. Um, the product here is um, a tool for conducting um, JHA, your job hazard, hazard analysis, and also a general manual that, you, that folks could use to assess um, the feasibility of using robots um, for activities on the yeah, on the different jobs that they have. So those are the two key products of our, of our study. So kind of like going into some of the results that we, that we found, you know, through the different um, research methods that we, that we implemented. Um, starting with the, with the literature review, um, we found that we could classify robots um, into three groups or call them three levels. Um, the levels here are based on First of all, the, the proximity of the worker to um, the technology itself, which I'll explain in a few, in a few seconds. And also we were looking at the level of automation. So um, is there gonna be a lot of input from the, from the worker for the, for, the, for the technology to function, or if it's fully automated? Uh, with regards to proximity to the worker, we're looking at, okay, fine, is the technology something that is directly gonna be in close contact with the worker uh, for it to function, or is it going to be slightly more detached? So we use those two criteria to classify the different levels of R, and we came up with three. The first is wearable robots, which is going to be things like your exoskeleton, be them passive or active. Um, the next is your remote controlled robots, which would um, be your drones and your unmanned ground vehicle. And the third category is gonna be more of the single task robots that we have on site. So the, those robots that we use for brick laying and then um, for grind, concrete grinding, polishing and so forth. Um, here's a picture of the, the, the three levels that we identified. The, um, the next thing that we identified was about 40 hazards that are either introduced because of the use of these technologies or the use of the technologies increases the possible negative impact um, of those hazards on workers that are using the technologies or working very close to um, operations that are relying on these um, robots. We classified the different hazards into seven groups. Again, we, we relied on some of the classification processes that OSHA has with regards to robots, and uh, we came up with seven groups of, um, of hazards just to help you know, with you know, thinking through and trying to work um, with the, the JHA that we, that, that we came up with. The next thing there again, we try to identify the you know, strategies for, for dealing with the safety risks that arises through um, human robot interaction. And we found about 22 of them, which again is going to be, which again is in the report. So you folks can see that when the report is published officially. Then we found um, factors that typically influence the um, adoption and implementation of um, robots in construction. When looking at the, the, the Delphi process, um, the first round that we conducted again was to help us, first of all, figure out if the folks that we reached out to were truly experts. So we went through the typical um, expert you know, uh, qualification process, and um, we were able to identify 29 um, um, participants who met the requires that um, are typically expected for experts in the Delphi panel. We had 17 folks from the academic space, and we had 12 from, from industry. Um, one of the questions that we asked them was their familiarity with, with robots, the different types of robots that we have in different levels. And most of the folks who participated were, were quite familiar with the technology. So that kind of like improves the, the trust, you know, or the, or the validity of the, some of the results that I'll be, you know, going through here in a few minutes. All right, so the, um, 
when we went through that, we were also able to identify the hazards that were tied to each robot in, from the first round of the Delphi process. And again, that's what we have. We have about 13 of those hazards were strongly, were strongly associated with um, your wearable robots, which is exoskeleton and so forth. Um, for remote operated robots, we had about 11. And for the single task robots, we had about 12 hazards that were closely associated with them. The second phase of the Delphi was focused primarily on um, helping us to identify the risks, the safety risk level for each of the hazards that we identified in the previous round. And um, to do that, we relied on skills that have been developed by you know, other, other professors and you know, researchers, um, Matt, uh, Matt Hallowell and um, Nemia Mustafa and Dr. Gambich as well. They've worked on developing you know, you know, linear and exponential skills. So we relied on that. And uh, we also try to convert it into something that will be simple for folks to use in practice as well. So we came up with a little process of determining, you know, what low, moderate, high, and extreme risk would be. Um, so we, we did that also in the second round of the Delphi. Um, we also had to verify consensus with regards to the information that we had received from the first round and also the second round, and we relied on um, Kendall um, W coefficient, uh, standard deviation, and we looked into um, the Prombach Alpha for consistency within the data that we collected. So um, the third phase um, of the Delphi focused primarily on, first, again, verifying that the safety risk levels that I showed earlier in that color code made sense, um, and then we did that, and most of the folks who responded uh, I believe 25 out of 26 folks who responded agreed that uh, the process that we used was, was good and they approved of it. And um, we also tried to figure out how to tie the different strategies to the risk. So what strategies would be um, effective at reducing certain risks? So we, we looked into that as well and we provided um, such pairings to the participants for them to evaluate using the Likert scale. And I think well, that was a, a 10 point Likert scale. Um, and this is an example of the result of the combination between the hazards and the strategies. And um, provided on the right side is the median value, the mean value, and the standard deviation. So the goal here was to you know, provide strategies that could help prevent specific hazards that we have identified as critical hazards. Um, so that was achieved in the, in the third round of the Delphi. Again, we checked for consensus and all that to ensure that the experts agreed um, to whatever we were putting in the final report. So the last step here was to, you know, provide, you know, folks in the field, folks who have experience from an academic space and also safety perspective, so we can know if the tools we developed were are, or are going to be valuable to the end target, the end users, that's going to be safety professionals on the job site. So um, here is um, a summary data on the experts that we, we discussed with, their demographic information, and also the results that we got. So we assessed two documents. We assessed um, the job hazard analysis tool that we, de that we developed, and also the um, assessment manual. And here I'm just showing you the ratings from the assessment manual. So you can see that largely, uh, most folks who you know participated in the second um, in the feedback or in the interviews were you know were positive, felt good about the the tools that we that we developed. So kind of like in summary, the few things that I want to highlight that we did that we that we found was that again multiple hazards um, are associated with the use of RA. We we're able to I think for the first time identify a good number of them and to class and to classify them into groups. Uh, we're able to assess the safety risks and hazards um, for the different technologies that we saw, um, the three main levels. And we also looked at them from a task level. We looked at three tasks, but I had to go through that real quick because of time. And we're able to find strategies that we feel will be useful and they, and they were assessed by our participants. And that's in the report. Then we came up with two tools that we believe will be very useful um, when thinking about robotics and the safety of robots in construction. So um, this is more like the cover page of the materials that we put together. Um, I, I believe it's going to be online um, very soon. Um, so with that, I will close the presentation. I think I'm right on 15 minutes. So thank you for listening. And um, I will take questions after the, the next presentation. Thanks. Thanks, Shuma. Great job. That's yeah, so why I have to go a little bit fast just to keep to the time.
<laughs> you were very thorough and quick. Uh, Much appreciated. Uh, all right, John, I am going to pass presenter control to you. All right, thank uh, you. Thank you very you much. You should be good to go sharing your screen. Thank you. And there you go. Can you see the slides there? Yep, it looks good. Great. Uh, thank you, Chuma, for sticking to your 15 minutes. Uh, that'll give us some time here. And I'll, I'll start uh, on the presentation for our little small study here and um, talk a little bit about that. And then ZU will join us as well. We'll try to keep it to as short as possible so we have time for questions after. So uh, our, our study, uh, as you can see the title there, Identification and Assessment of Musculoskeletal Disorders. That's a, a lot of syllables. MSDs. Uh, MSD risk for concrete formwork systems. So uh, it's focused on obviously MSDs and then different types of systems that are used for concrete forming. And, and perhaps some of you who are listening are, are uh, knowledgeable about concrete formwork systems. If not, we'll show you a few pictures about them. Uh, it's something that we deal with here in the world of civil and construction engineering. And uh, it's something that we have the opportunity to modify or select different types of systems. So it's a way to either uh, affect, or it's a way to affect the, the MSD um, uh, exposure for workers. Uh, so I'll, I'll continue on here. I'll give the first portion and then ZU will chime in with the results. So a little bit of an introduction just about MSDs. Perhaps you're well aware of what they are. Uh, they are injuries to soft tissues and uh, many different so types of soft, soft tissues in our bodies, muscles, tendons, ligaments, and so forth. So that's uh, something that we worry about uh, as we have perhaps repetitive motions. Uh, we have some types of strains uh, due to excessive force or excessive loading on our bodies, excessive twisting, will lead to perhaps MSDs. In construction, we unfortunately have a significant risk exposure to MSDs. There have been some studies that show the rates of MSDs and how they are prevalent within the construction industry. You can see some of the numbers there. A rate per 10,000 full-time workers uh, 28.9 in construction compared to 27.2 throughout the workforce. And 34% um, of the workers had at least one type of MSD sim symptom uh, due to, uh, as a result of a study that was done and reported last year. We find that they affect people of many different ages, occupations, different work activities within the construction industry. So they're very prevalent. Concrete formwork, to give a little bit of a background on that, if you're not aware, um, is something that's used to cast the concrete. We use formwork for walls, we use it for columns, for beams, for slabs, many different elements. And uh, you can see some pictures on the right there. Uh, we have studied the prevalence, as I said, of MSDs related to concrete formwork, and, and we do find that there's a high rate. It's due to the fact that Constructing the formwork is very physically demanding. It requires awkward postures and uh, awkward motions as well. If you can imagine on the right hand side there, you can see some of those shoring posts that need to be stood up. And then we need to put in the, the joists and the girders and the sheathing, the plywood on top. And we need to do that for a complete system for our entire floor, for a building, for example. And then we need to do it for every floor that we cast. And so it's a repetitive process on each floor level, but then it's also repeating that process from one floor level to the next. The, the diagrams or the pictures that we show there show wall formwork, and it also, sh also shows some slab formwork. What we are focusing on in our study is uh, different types of formwork conventional or job-built formwork, which is something that might look like the upper right photograph there, where you're going to build it on the site out of timber and plywood. The lower two 
photos there are prefabricated or engineered formwork systems, and we would classify those as either prefabricated engineered formwork or modular formwork. The difference is the modular formwork is provided to the site in a module and an assembly, whereas the prefabricated or engineered formwork is individual pieces. So there's a little bit more work that needs to go on on the site for prefabricated formwork. What did we do in our study? So uh, like Chuma described, we set up a, a research methodology and I'll try to describe it here. We set up a number of objectives. <clears throat> you can see objective number one. First of all, we're gonna identify the activities related to job built forms and prefabricated engineering form systems. To do that, we did a literature review as well as some use some surveys and some observations on the site. Secondly, we wanted to know about the MSD symptoms. What are the symptoms that workers face when they are instructing formwork? Those two together lead to then objectives three and four. Um, specifically, objective three is to determine the major causes of work-related MSDs experienced by form workers looking at, again, literature review, surveys, and observations, so mixed methods there. And then number four, to quantify the MSD risks associated with the use of these different systems. We actually have the opportunity to perhaps um, lower that risk depending on which type of formwork system we select. Lastly, we have objective number five, which is provide recommendations uh, on the prevention of MSDs during formwork construction. A little bit on of the details. Um, oh, last also here on this slide, we are focusing on horizontal formwork, which is slabs. In terms of the uh, survey, we had a, a self-report uh, survey questionnaire that we developed and it included questions on a number of categories. So first of all, some background information about the worker themselves, some demographic information. How long have they worked in the industry? Uh, what is their typical role, their age, and so forth? We asked them about formwork construction. What are the steps or the processes that they use to construct each type of formwork? We also asked them about MSD discomfort. What did they feel when they're out there, when they go home, what aches, right? And we ask them to focus that response using this chart here. We ask them about the severity of the symptoms, the frequency of the symptoms, and whether they are work-related or not. And so they filled out uh, this chart right here. This is for the upper body. Body. We had a similar one for lower body, and that provided then the information about the MSD symptoms, as well as asking them about the causes or aggravating factors. The, the uh, analysis also included uh, some observations where we went to different sites, we observed the work, we took some video recordings, we then took those video recordings and the observations back to our office and we conducted an assessment using the rapid entire body assessment method or REVA method, which is a well-known method for assessing uh, the whole body and its posture during a, the performance of a, an operation. And um, we looked at uh, different elements of the formwork construction process, for example, climbing up a ladder, lifting a joist into place, putting up a shoring post, uh, climbing down the ladder, uh, measuring something, all of the different postures that are part of that process, each, each step in that process. We've got REBA scores, and we then classified them as in the different levels of risk, as you can see, negligible all the way to very high. To do the assessment, we used a, a tool uh, developed by Kinetica Labs. It's a risk assessment tool. And it basically, uh, you upload a video, a short video, it will track the worker in the video, do an analysis of the angles, the movements, and um, what the worker is doing at a, at, 
during each part of the video, and then it'll calculate the REBA score automatically for you. It's a very useful tool. Lastly, for my part, we focused on uh, five different projects all in the Pacific Northwest here. And uh, you can see the description of the projects there. They were all building type projects. And um, you can see the type of formwork as well, prefabricated engineered or modular uh, type of formwork system. We found that most projects do not use the um, conventional job built formwork systems anymore. So we focused on the prefabricated engineered and the modular formwork systems. We were out there for two or three days on each project doing the videos and then uh, came back, as I said, and analyzed the video recordings. Now I'm going to pass it on to ZU, who's going to talk about the results. There you go. Yeah. So the result part. So as a result, um, so for the five construction sites we visited, um, 29 male workers filled out the survey and the majority of them are working as carpenters or carpenter of practice. Um, and they're familiar with the different types of formwork construction systems. Next. <laughs> yeah, so um, based on their survey responses, there's no distinct difference at the activity level between the, um, the two different types of formwork construction. However, there is a noticeable difference at the task level when constructing with prefabricated formwork, including modular formwork, um, significantly less work are performed in sawing, cutting, nailing, screwing, drilling components or other materials. And generally participants felt that prefabricated formwork is easier and faster to build as the majority of the components are machine lifted or lowered um, um, machine loaded and unloaded. Um, however, for their conventional job build formworks, they feel um, they are more versatile, but it takes longer to build as the, some of the component need to be field crafted. Next slide. Um, in terms of um, form workers level of discomfort due to MSD, 93% of them have experienced MSD symptoms during the past 12 months. And um, also using the body map, we analyzed the MSD risk score based on the level of severity and frequency um, using a scoring system. And we categorized the, um, the summary results are reported on the figure, um, right? So the, the estimated risk was categorized into low, moderate, high, critical risk, and they were um, color-coded in the body map. Um, we found that um, the lower back and upper back are the two areas that are associated with critical risk. Next. Um, we also identified several tests that lead to MSD symptoms like holding materials or components, pushing, pulling from, um, or other components, lifting, lowering materials. Next. In terms of physical factors, um, the top three contributing factors are um, repetition, awkward posture, and use of forces. Next slide. Um, besides analyzing field worker survey results, we also conducted posture analysis using rebar method based on what we collect um, during our site visit. The construction tasks we analyzed are listed here and um, some sample pictures of working posture used to perform different um, tasks are also shown on this slide. So as you can see, awkward um, posture like bo body bending or twisting, working with hand at above um, shoulder were frequently used in foam work construction. Not to mention this foam components are quite heavy the majority of them exceed 22 pounds. There, and those vertical components, the shoring post, are over more than 50 pounds. Um, after careful review and selection, a total of 389 working postures were assessed using the rebar method in our study. Next slide. <laughs> um, as a result, regardless of which type of homework system is used, the majority of homework tasks expose workers to between 
medium and high MSD risk levels to their whole body with rebar score ranging from 4 to 10. Um, their physical contributing factors identified using the posture analysis are consistent with um, their participants' self-reported results. So foam workers have to bend and twist often, um, work at height with frequent overhead reaching, and use hammers repetitively and forcefully. And also handling heavy material is a primary contributory factor leading to the development of MSD. And when um, the comparison between prefabricated forms and modular forms show that working with prefabricated forms expose workers to higher risk levels because the sheathing panel used in prefabricated form work systems are quite heavy and the size are large, uh, which make it awkward to handle and place. As for modular forms, the size of a modular panel is relatively small, the, the, uh, the weight is relatively light, so handling and placing these modular panels is much easier. Additionally, um, the modular panel, a modular panel is an integrated assembly, so there is no need to place a substantial number of supporting beams um, beneath the, the modular panel. So there is no need to connect and fix um, the panel with the supporting beams with nails. So therefore, um, significantly less and less time and effort are needed when working with modular forms. Next slide. So based on our um, analysis and relevant MSD prevention um, resources provided by NIOSH and CPWR, we also provided some um, recommendations um, to prevent MSD or minimize the, the symptoms. Um, based on, and we also categorized them into um, four categorized um, based on the hierarchy of control. So the first one, substitution, this one means that we can um, use modular panel systems instead of using the more health hazardous um, job build or prefabricated forms. And engineering improvements, those are um, physical changes to equipment, workflow, or work environment. And we provided some um, recommendations on that. Administrative control example includes that um, having a well-planned, clear workspace and sequencing tasks. So um, that to minimize the time workers spend um, carrying loads. And also rotating um, from workers through several different tasks during a shift to prevent them from performing the same repetitive task for a long period. And then uh, last one, work practice modification. Um, example include like training workers to make sure that um, their work area is within their comfortable read zone by adjusting the height or the location where they are standing. Um, and also when handling foam components that are heavier than 51 pounds, um, have at least two people to lift the load. Last slide. <laughs> Uh, so in conclusion, in this study, we investigate the prevalence of MSD informed workers and assess MSD risks with the use of different types of foam work systems. Um, so we found that a high prevalence of MSD symptoms exist among foam workers. Repetition awkward working posture and use of forms are some of the contributing factors to the development of MSD, which put worker at high risk of developing MSD in the lower back, upper back, neck, and shoulder. Um, based on the posture analysis using the rebar method, form work task and activity create median and high level MSD risk to worker's whole body. And compared to working with prefabricated form work systems, modular form work system create less economic exposure to worker because um, that requires less time and physical effort. Based on the research finding, we also provide their recommendations to construction contractors, foam workers, foam designers, and tour manufacturers within four hazard control categories. Um, their recommendations offer various opportunities, tools, and techniques to help prevent MSD in foam workers. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you both for a great presentation. And uh, see you. I know. Um, oh, you have to head to class. Sorry, so, to <laughs> thank you for joining. Um, and uh, John uh, will be looking to you to answer any questions. Um, I don't see anything yet in the chat or Q and A. Um, everyone. Feel free to submit questions now, and we appreciate you um, sticking with us, even though we ran a little over with all of our technical difficulties. Um, so I'm going to start with a few questions that we got in advance. Um, so let me ask uh, Chuma, I'll ask you this first. What was your experience like applying for funding through the small study program? Um, thanks for that question. Um, my experience uh, was that, you know, you get the LOI ready, you submit it, um, but I think it's, fun, it's very, very important that it aligns with um, like the neural goals, you know, the, those critical goals that are, you know, construction facing. Uh, because sometimes I know I did a couple times and I, and I got rejected, and my LOIs got rejected. But the comments there were always were always positive, you know, and trying to point to what um, CPWR is actually looking for, and it's timely. I usually got like you know you know comments back like in a month, and um, that helps you know if you want to recalibrate and submit again. And um, with regard to the full proposal, I still believe that the time frame in terms of that that it takes for you to get your response was also reasonable. So um, it's just a matter of you know ensuring that the the goal of the of the proposal is in line with what CPWR is actually focusing on, and that um, you end up having good product at the end of the proposal. Because yes, while science is great, while developing foundational knowledge is great, um, I think CPWR is very interested in the research to practice part of it. So how do you so you should produce products that can be transferred or used by folks in the industry? So two cents. Great answer, thanks. Um, John, do you have anything to add? Or I know you've um, been through this a few times, so um, anything to add about being a funding recipient as well? Yeah, I can uh, share my uh, experience a little bit here. I've been lucky to, to be able to uh, be funded by several of these now over the years. And and like Chuma, I, I submit them and sometimes uh, they're of interest sometimes they're not and um, when they are of interest it's nice uh, they're a little little pot of money that we can use i can use to support a student to help a student get involved i i appreciate the opportunity to submit a very short letter of intent initially rather than a a full 40 page proposal and uh, then it get rejected so uh, i use it uh, for helping to train PhD students as well, who perhaps write the letter of intent with my assistance. And uh, we talk through the process of submitting it, uh, review, responding to the review comments, and then submitting the full proposal. And I know Chuma did that on another CPWR small study while he was a student here. And ZU did that on this study that we described here. So it's a, a wonderful opportunity to get graduate students involved. Great, thanks. Um, I think this is uh, another one for you, John, and I don't know if you have an answer, but um, the question came in, do you have any data or research concerning um, lead, radon, or mold poisoning and musculo musculoskeletal disorders? Uh, I do not at, that, at this point in time. Um, I, I, thinking about what I've read or heard on the site, I, I don't know if that's an issue. So unfortunately, I, I'm not able to contribute on that topic. No problem. Um, we are coming up on the hour anyway, so I have just, uh, we have one other question that came in that asks, how would I submit a request for funding for researching new technologies for my apprentice program? And I would just say uh, to that, that 
you know, Trish went over the process of uh, applying for funding in the beginning of the webinar, and it is on the website. It's the same um, for, for everyone and for every type of project. Um, you can just go on there and figure out how to submit an LOI as the first step. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up. Again, this was recorded. I will do a little editing uh, to make, <laughs> make the recording smoother than the first time around, and we will be sharing that um, for you and your colleagues. Um, but thank you to all of our attendees for joining and sticking with us. And um, thank you, John and Chuma and Trish, for presenting today. Um, really good information and great projects. Thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you.